exceptionally on Tuesday, because there's a spring break in between. So on Tuesday after spring break, your homework segment will be due. Any questions about logistics? All right, and today we'll cover something that's quite a bit different from what we've been doing the past two lectures, but it's still very closely related. It's decision networks and value of perfect information. Effectively, what we're going to do, we're going to tie all the probabilistic reasoning that we've covered back into decision making. All right, decision networks. Here's a first example of a decision network. What's the scenario here? As an agent, our robot could decide to just go out or bring along an umbrella. So two choices in terms of action. Then the variables not under the agent's control are weather and forecast. So these are random variables. It could be sunny or rainy. And the forecast about the weather could be that it's going to be rainy or going to be sunny. Um, the forecast is influenced by the weather, um, but it can be noisy. And then we have this utility node over here, which encodes how high your utility the agent receives or experiences as a function of the parents of this node. So there are two parents, whether the agent brought the umbrella or not, and what the weather is like. Each is binary, so we have a total of four possible scenarios, which are pictured over here. One scenario is, it's sunny, and our robot didn't bring the umbrella and can happily play with the beach ball. Um, the second scenario is where it's sunny, but our robot brought their umbrella and now they're a little sad because they have to carry around their umbrella, whereas the other robots are just playing. Um, then it could be rainy, and the robot could have forgotten the umbrella, which is the worst case scenario. And then it could be rainy, but the robot brought the umbrella, so at least the robot can shield itself from the rain. Alright, so notice that we still have what is a base net over here, but we've hooked up some extra variables to the base net that relate to decision making. There is one action variable here, there could in principle be more than one, denoted inside a rectangle to denote this is an action variable, and then there's the diamond shape variable, which is the utility node which encodes how good a certain scenario is as a function of the parent variables of the utility node. The goal when we work with decision networks is to find the action that maximizes expected utility given whatever evidence is observed. Okay. So we can directly operationalize this with a network that looks like this. There are base net nodes over here, then there are nodes for action and nodes for utility. And in this network we can calculate what action maximizes expected utility, or at least that's our goal. So keep in mind our notation, circular slash oval nodes are chance nodes, not under our control. Rectangular nodes are the action nodes, they are under our control and that's where we want to make a decision, what action we might want to take. And then the diamond shaped node is a utility node and the meaning of parents here for the utility node is that as we build the utility function, the utility function is only allowed to depend on the parents of the utility node, not to directly depend on any other nodes in the network. All right, so here's the question, yes? Okay, so why is the umbrella an evidence node in the network? Um, the umbrella is not an evidence node. The umbrella is a action node. Any other questions about this formalism? Okay, so here's the procedure to find the best action. First step, you instantiate all evidence. Okay? Then you choose, you essentially loop over all possible values your action can take. In this case, bring or not bring the umbrella, so you'd have a loop that you go around twice. Then once you've fixed 
your action node, you calculate a posterior for all parents of the utility node given the evidence. So let's say you fix, bring umbrella, then in this case maybe no evidence, so nothing to fix there, and then you run inference to find the posterior distribution of the parent nodes of the utility node given the evidence. Once you have the distribution for the parent node, in this case weather, you can compute an expected utility. Just now you can say, well, I have a distribution over possible instantiations of the parents, and I'm going to compute the expectation under that distribution of utility here. Then once you've done this for every possible action, you see which action resulted in the highest expected utility, that's the action you take. Okay, let's do an example. So here's an even smaller decision network. We got rid of the forecast variable, so we just have one action variable, one utility node, one chance node. Here is the probability distribution for the chance node. Um, we'll also need a table for the utility node, which encodes for every possible parent instantiation what the utility is if that were to be what happens. So leave the umbrella and it being sunny is the best possible outcome with a utility of 100. Leaving the umbrella and it being rain is the worst possible outcome with a utility of zero. And then there are some intermediate values here for the other scenarios. Okay, for umbrella, there is no table, there's just the agent choosing the actions. So let's look at the first possible action, leave the umbrella at home. Then we can compute the expected utility by summing over all possible outcomes for the parent variables of the utility node, which in this case is just weather and then use a weighted sum of utility values. So we have some of all possible weather values, probability of that weather value times the utility for leaving the umbrella at home and having that weather value. So we can compute this by looking into this table over, these two tables over here. In this case, we get 0.7 probability for sunny. The utility for leaving the umbrella at home and it being sunny is 100 over here. It's a 0.3 probability of it being rainy. The utility for rain and leaving the umbrella at home is zero. So read that off here. And we get an expected utility of 70. We can do the exact same thing for the scenario where we bring the umbrella. So take the umbrella with us. Same kind of computation. Expect utility for take is a weighted sum over possible outcomes of the parent variables of the utility node where we have in the sum the probability of that outcome times the utility of that outcome um, with the action take. So we can read off these numbers from tables and we get an expected utility of 35. We compare the two numbers, 70 and 35. 70 is better, so the preferred action is to leave the umbrella at home and that's our optimal decision here. So notation-wise, what we're writing here is the maximum expected utility. Phi stands for the empty set. So it's saying the maximum expected utility when we have an empty evidence set, so no variables have been observed, is the max over all action choices of the expected utility when we take that particular action. And in this case, we saw that 70 is the highest, so the value for it is 70. <coughs> we could in principle be even more explicit here if we wanted to. We could also write this as expected utility of an action given the empty evidence set. Okay, any questions about the procedure or the notation? What we've seen here is actually a lot like what we looked at in the lecture where we covered expected max. In fact, we can draw this out as what we call an outcome tree. So here's again our decision network from the previous slide. And now writing this like we would have done in our expected max lecture, it would look like this. We start out and are asked to make a decision. Whether we take the umbrella or leave it at home. After we take Take umbrella, we'll leave it at home, whatever our decision is, a chance node kicks in, which is how the weather ends up being instantiated. 
it could be sunny or rainy. Then once that chance node has kicked in, we reach the leaf nodes and our utility function tells us for each leaf node what the value is of achieving that particular outcome. So it's pretty much like Expectamax or MDPs, which encode very similar problems. What's changed? Really only a very minor thing. What's changed here is that we're keeping track of our information that we have available explicitly. Which at this point is really nothing, but we're very explicitly annotating it here with the fact that we have observed no evidence variable, so we have the empty set, and we have to make a decision here while we only have available to us the empty set of observations. And throughout this lecture, this will start changing. We might have evidence variables that are available when we make a decision, which might help us make a decision that's more important. And then again here, we're very explicit that the chance node kicks in using a conditional distribution for weather given all evidence variables, which in this case are the empty set, but in other scenarios, there could be something here that is not the empty set and that would influence the chance node's distribution. So we're being very explicit about where these probabilities come from and what information we have collected so far. The reason this will become important is that this way we can start reasoning about whether collecting a certain piece of information is worthwhile or not worthwhile, or how valuable it is, how much would we be willing to pay to get a certain piece of information. Okay, so let's look at a slightly more complicated scenario. We now have a forecast, and the forecast says that it's likely going to be bad weather. Okay. Then our first step in the calculation is to look at the distribution of the parent variables of the utility node given the evidence variable, so the distribution over weather given that the forecast is bad. This here is a base net. We know how to run inference in a base net. We can run variable elimination. It's such a simple base net. We can even just apply a base rule here. It's just two nodes. And if we were to run inference, we would end up with this distribution here for weather given the forecast is bad. Note that this is different from the original distribution where we didn't have a forecast we had a probability of sunny of 70%, rainy 30%. Now it's changed because the forecast is bad. This affects our distribution over weather outcomes. After we've done that, we go through exactly the same steps as we went through before. We look at each possible action, and then for each action, compute the expected utility if we were to take that action. So let's look at the leave action first. We now compute the expected utility of leave Given the evidence that the forecast equals bad, which is the sum over all possible outcomes of the parent variables of the utility node, in this case, the only chance node there is weather, the probability of that outcome, given our evidence variables, and then the utility for that particular chance node outcome combined with our action. This will be a sum over two terms, one for the outcome sun, one for the outcome rain. The outcome sum has a probability of 0.34 and will be multiplied with sun and leave is what we're looking at, so it will be multiplied with 100. The outcome rain will have a probability of 0.66 and will be multiplied with the utility of rain and leave, which is 0. So spelling this out, we get this little calculation here, and the expected utility of leaving the umbrella at home, given the forecast is bad, is 34. Then we can do the same calculation for when we take the umbrella, exact same calculation, except that we now look at these entries over here for the utility um, lookup, and we end up with an expected utility of take, given a bad forecast of 53. We check which is the highest, take is higher, so our best action when the forecast is bad is to take the umbrella with us. Now, notation-wise, what we've done here is we, we looked at the maximum expected utility when the forecast equals bad. So our information set here is not empty anymore, it's that the forecast is bad. It's the max over all possible actions of the expected utility of an action given the forecast is bad, which in this case, there are two actions and the highest one achieves 53, and here we are. So we see that after we receive the forecast, bad, our optimal 
reflection has changed. Any questions about this calculation? Then let's look at the outcome tree for this particular network. So what does it look like? Um, we still have a decision node at the top. We have to first choose whether we take the umbrella or leave it. But at the time we choose this, we already have some information. We know that the forecast is bad. We explicitly annotate that in the tree. Then after we choose our action, a chance node kicks in. Either way, that chance node now will be governed by the distribution whether, given the forecast is bad, which is annotated this way, and then we'll have a split on that on both sides. And then at the bottom, again, we have the utility nodes that we already had before. So what changed is that the distribution here and here is now different from what we had when we had no evidence. Okay, let's look at a early example from when we had our first lecture on probability. So this is Ghostbusters. So what was the problem here? We are faced with a grid. There is a single ghost. We don't know in which location the ghost is. We know the, loca the location of the ghost doesn't change. We just don't know which one it is. But we can sense. And when we sense, we get an observation that is a color. And that indicates in a noisy way how far away the ghost is from the location where we sense. And so if we were to play this game, um, we essentially pay a price of one whenever we sense and we get a reward of 250 when we bust in the right location but if we bust in the wrong location our game is over and we forego the opportunity to, to maybe later bust in the right location so if we just kind of play this game yellow that might be near the ghost let's sense a little more orange is even more likely to be close to the ghost red even more likely see um, no. Well, uh, it's probably somewhere here, probably one of the two red squares, most likely this one, just intuitively, not doing a formal calculation in my head here. So let's bust that ball at that bottom red square, see what happens. It was a hit, so we won. And we have a pretty high reward because we sensed about um, 12 times, roughly, or 15 times, so we lost. 15 points that way, but then we gain 250 points um, by hitting in the right spot. All right, now let's play this game again in a slightly more informed way. So if we set up a phase net where the location of the ghost is a variable in the base net, and then every possible sensory measurement is another variable in the base net, then every time we sense, we can run inference in the base net and compute the distribution over where the ghost might be given the measurements. So now that's being done underneath for us. So now when we sense, we see an updated distribution over where the ghost might be. There are a lot of locations it is with a reasonable probability. Maybe that sense here. Um, looks like there's a lot of probability mass up here uh, and here. Here, not so much anymore at this point. There's a lot more probability mass down here now. Um, over here at this point. Um, we can sense around that location to see if it influences our distribution, and it does. So at this point, we have a 99% chance that the ghost is over there. We might decide that it's time to bust. Pick the bust action. Hopefully the ghost is indeed there, and we got it. So this was a much more informed way of playing the game. We were seeing the probabilities that could be computed based on the sensory model of where the ghost might be. It's still not the most informed way of playing the game. We're still making decisions by hand that are somewhat ad hoc, right? Why would we sense in a particular location? Why not in another location? What's the most informative place to sense? Like if you were to sense in a certain location, 
how likely is that to lead to a high utility at the end versus sensing in another location? That's the part we haven't formalized just yet. And that's the part we'll be able to formalize by the end of today's lecture, where we'll play this game again, but actually the computer will tell us, now sense here, now sense here, now it's time to bust. So let's formalize what we've been doing a little more and see how we can then get the computer to play this game for us in the optimal way. So what are we looking at here? This is the decision network corresponding to the problem we've been looking at. We have a random variable corresponding to ghost location over here. Then for every possible sensory location, there is a random variable that depends on the ghost location um, and that encodes some sense a noisy encoding of what the actual ghost location is. The way it was set up in the example we looked at was if the ghost is two moves away from a location then there's a distribution over green, yellow, orange, red that is very heavy on orange, less heavy on red, less heavy on yellow and even less heavy on green and as a function of the distance to the ghost the distribution will have more and more weight on green as you're further away from the ghost and more and more weight on red as you're closer to the ghost. There's a utility node over here which says as a function of the actual ghost location and the bust action, bust here you need to think of as an action where you have I believe 50 choices in general, m times n choices, you get to pick a location, each location is its own action so as a function of the actual ghost location and the location you pick, there is some utility here. If they match up, zero. Oh, sorry, if they match up, 250. If they don't match up, zero. All right. So what we need to look at now is how valuable measurements are. How valuable is it to get a measurement in one location over another location or of one random variable in general over another random variable? So let's start with a very simple example. So the idea here is that we try to compute the value of acquiring evidence. So here's a simple example. Let's consider the problem of buying oil drilling rigs. So more specifically, there is a location, random variable, encoding where the oil might be. In our case, there will be two possible locations, A or B. We don't know whether the oil is in location A, that well location B. You can buy drilling rights, either for location A or for location B. Clearly, if you buy the matching drilling rights with where the oil is, you can drill it out, make a lot of money. If you buy the mismatched location, you're kind of just drilling into rock and that has a low, low utility. Okay. So we have two blocks, A and B. Um, let's assume the utility of the oil that you could recover if you're in drilling in the right location is K. You can drill in only one location, so you have to choose one of the two locations. And the prior probabilities for each location are 0.5. So this is what it looks like when we complete that in a table for our decision diagram. Notice the matching drill location and oil location gives us K mismatched 0. So the expected utility, when you're faced with this problem, is going to be k over 2 because you don't know where the oil is. The best you can do is just pick one of the locations at random because you have no information to do anything better than picking it at random. Whichever location you pick, you have a 50% chance of finding the oil. So the expected utility is 1 half times k plus 1 half times 0, which is 1 half times k. Now you can ask yourself the question, what's the value of information of knowing the random variable O, which stands for the oil location? Any thoughts? How much would you be willing to pay in this scenario for somebody to tell you where the oil is? Well, if you knew where it is, you'd get an expected utility of K, since now the original scenario, scenario, you don't know where it is, your expected utility is k over 2. So 
the difference is k over 2. So you would be willing to pay k over 2. Ideally, you'd pay less than k over 2. That gives you a benefit from going through with that um, for this information. So the value of that information is the expected gain in maximum expected utility from getting that new information. So in this case, it'd be k over 2. Our notation here, VPI, stands for value of perfect information. Perfect information about the oil location. And the value of that is k over 2. Spelling this out here, the value of perfect information of oil location is equal to the maximum expected utility when we get to know the oil location minus the maximum expected utility when we have no evidence. So that's in general going to be the definition of value of perfect information for a specific set of random variables. The difference in maximum expected utility when you get to observe it versus when you didn't get to observe those variables. So let's look at our original example. This is our weather and forecast example. Could bring the umbrella or not. And then there's the utility based on weather and umbrella. So we can ask ourselves the question, what is the value of perfect information of getting to listen to the forecast? Would you be willing to spend time listening to the forecast? How much is it worth to do so? When we have no evidence, we already computed the maximum expected utility. We found that the optimal action when we have no evidence was to leave the umbrella at home and our expected utility would be 70. Now, with evidence, if the forecast is bad, we computed this already too. The way we did this, we ran inference, we found the posterior for weather, given the forecast is bad, and then computed the expected utility of each of the two possible actions under that posterior distribution and found that Taking the umbrella was the optimal thing to do, and it had an expected utility of 53. We can do that same calculation in the scenario where the forecast is good. Okay. So if the forecast is good, the maximum expected utility action is to leave the umbrella at home, and the expected utility there is 95. Why is this utility here? 95 higher than 70 here, even though in both cases we're leaving the umbrella at home. The difference is that our expectation is with respect to a different distribution. At the top here, the distribution is the one where we have no information about the forecast, where there was a 70% chance of sunny weather. Here, our distribution is conditioned on having heard a good forecast, in which case there's a 95% chance of sunny weather. And so our expected utility is 95% times 100 plus 5% times 0, which is 95. Okay, now the next step is that we need to think about what is the value of getting to observe a forecast, right? Before we observe a forecast, we don't know what the outcome is going to be. So we need to think about two possible scenarios here. If we're going to pay something to observe a forecast, one outcome is that after we paid, we see a bad forecast. Another outcome is that after we paid, we see a good forecast. And we know for each specific scenario what the maximum expected utility is going to be, but we don't know which scenario we're going to get. But we do know that there is a Bayesian here encoding the distribution over these random variables, including over forecast. So from this Bayesian, we can actually compute the prior distribution over forecast, and we can use that to see how often we land in the scenario where the forecast is bad, how often do we land in the scenario where the forecast is good, average those two utilities, and based on that see what our expected utility would be if we were getting the forecast, even though we don't know ahead of time what the forecast outcome is going to be. So the forecast distribution here is actually 0.59 and 0.41. So the maximum expected utility 
the MEU. In the case where our information set is forecast, but we don't know the value of the forecast, we just know that we will know forecast, just don't know yet what it's going to be, is the average of the maximum expected utility in the weighted way of when the forecast comes out uh, good and when it comes out bad. Then this thing here is the maximum expected utility when we have no access to any evidence variables before we make our decision. And then the difference between these two is the value of perfect information of the forecast random variable. In this case, to make the difference, it's 7.8. So you're willing to give up somehow in utility currency 7.8 in exchange for getting to find out what the forecast is before you make your decision on whether to take or leave your umbrella. In general, this is what the value of perfect information equation looks like. Let's parse this. So VPI, value of perfect information, of getting to observe a random variable E prime before you make your decisions in a situation where you already know the evidence set E. So in this case, we're not necessarily starting from an empty evidence set. You're in a situation where some evidence E is already available and you're asking if in addition uh, we're able to get access to E prime, what would be the value of that information? Um, well, it's the value of getting to act with that information, which is encoded over here. This is the weighted sum over possible outcomes of what you would get to observe of the maximum expected utility in case of that particular outcome E prime. And then you compare that with the maximum expected utility if you did not get to observe E prime before you make your decision, which is expressed over here. Any questions about the definition? Okay, so that, that's a good question. Um, so essentially getting at which variables should we look at and which variables should we be most concerned about, right? In this case, we haven't really worried about that actually. We've just said, well, let's assume we might or might not get ourselves access to forecasts and let's see if it's worthwhile to try to get access to forecast or not. But we haven't actually done any kind of search or anything over all possible variables to see which variable would be most informative. We've just looked at one variable. Now in principle we could of course layer this on top of what we're doing here and now that we know how to compute the value of perfect information of one variable, we could search which is the best variable or we could do the exact same calculation with multiple variables and then search which set of multiple variables is best for us to get to observe. Now when you're saying we're looking at this from this perspective as value of perfect information, we think of it as a positive thing. We'll actually see in two slides from now that this quantity is always bigger than or equal to zero. There are actually no variables that will make this a, qu a quantity that's below zero. Your worst case is a variable that makes this equal to zero. That's essentially a variable that doesn't tell you anything about what action you might want to take. So in that sense, the answer to your question is we don't worry about variables that might make this negative because they don't exist. Question there. Does it matter at all that for if you know that the forecast is, if the forecast is going to be good, like you know it that the forecast is good, would that change your decision? And so it wasn't actually the fact that you knew it was good because the forecast was good, but your action, like knowing that the forecast was good didn't change your action, so does that at all that's a good question. So the action that we took with no information available to us was leaving the umbrella at home. With the information that the forecast is good, it was still leaving the umbrella at home. So the action stayed the same, 
The reason there is a 95 here and there used to be a 70 is that once the forecast is good, the distribution of our possible weather outcomes has changed. And so our expected utility in the world where the forecast has been exposed to be good is different than the distribution we had over weather when we don't know the forecast yet. And so in this case, that's why this number changes. Now, to get to your question in a little more detail, if you look at the other one, when the forecast is bad, the action does change. We switch from leaving the umbrella at home to taking it with us. And so even though the action doesn't change down here, it does change up here. And so what we're seeing is that the outcome of the variable we're observing, the forecast variable, can affect our action. And, as a, and because we can tune our action to that outcome, we're able to improve our expected utility. Now, I think what you were getting at is that in a special case where no matter what the outcome, no matter what the forecast is, good or bad, if the optimal action either way is to leave the umbrella at home, then you will see that when you do this calculation, even though these numbers wouldn't be 70 because the distributions have changed, when you average them the right way, the number you get down here would be 70 again. Because you would always be leaving your umbrella at home and the distribution over weather hasn't changed fundamentally, right? It's just that you now split it up and when you do know the forecast bad, when you know the forecast is good, but on average, it's still 70% time good, 30% time bad weather. And so it'll actually come out to exactly the same number. This will be true in general. If a variable you get to observe, if for that variable, no matter what you observe, the maximum expected utility action is the same as if you did not observe that variable for all possible observations of that variable, then the value of perfect information of that particular variable will be zero. Let's take a short break here, and after the break, we'll get into more specifics about the properties of value of perfect information. All right, let's uh, restart. Any questions about lectures so far? Then let's start tying this back into these outcome trees. So let's step through the different scenarios. Assume we have some evidence equals E, and that's our starting point. We can look at the value if we have to make our decision right now about our action, which can be written this way. We would maximize over all possible actions. For that action, what is the expected utility, which is the weighted sum weighted by the probability of S, given the evidence where S are the variables that are parents of the utility node, and then the utility for instantiation S and having taken action A. Then assume we see that some new evidence came in for the variable E prime and it happens to be small E prime. What is the value can we act then? That's the maximum expected utility when we have E and E prime available to us, which is effectively the same as we had over here. The only difference is that wherever we had E appear before, it's now E and E prime. Because we have two evidence variables rather than one. Now, before we know what E prime is going to be, it's still a random variable, and we'd actually have to sum overall possible outcomes to see what our maximum expected utility is. Um, if we don't know yet what E prime is going to be, but we do know that we get to observe it before we choose an action. So, in this case, the equation looks like this. The maximum expected utility, when we already know small e, we know we will know e prime before we make a decision on our action, is a weighted sum over possible outcomes for e prime. And then once we know e prime, we would take whatever the best action is, given we know e prime and e, the maximum expected utility is what we'd get, which is this thing over here. And the value of information will be the gap 
between these two here. A scenario where you just have E and a scenario where you have E to start with, but you know you will get to observe E prime before you make your decision on what action you take. So that's our value of perfect information for E prime given E. The same thing holds true if these are multiple variables. So you can just as well think of E as a set of variables, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, and so forth. You can think of E prime as another set of variables, y1, y2, y3, y4, and so forth. The exact same equations will go through. So you can just think of that set of variables as a super variable that happens to have a bigger domain that consists of all combinations of values the original var variables can take on. In terms of outcome trees, here's what the first scenario looks like. We have something for E, let's say it's plus E. We're asked to make a decision on what action we're going to take. So that's our maximizer node there. We're going to try to maximize expected utility. We choose between our two actions available to us. After that, we hit a chance node, which is following a distribution probability over possible states of the world given the evidence was plus E. And then we'll have some actual outcome of what the world is like, and there will be some utility associated with that outcome combined with the action we took. Second scenario where we have both E and E prime observed, in this case plus E and plus E prime, is exactly the same as the first scenario, except that we, re we replaced the appearance of plus E with the appearance of both plus E and plus E prime in all places where there was plus E just have a bigger set of evidence available. Now the thing we're really interested in is the case where we know we'll get to observe E prime before we act, but we don't know yet now what it's going to be, and we're curious what is the value of getting to observe E prime. So here's what that tree looks like. We start with just knowing plus E. At that point there's a chance node now at the top. And there's some probability it's going to be plus E prime. There's some probability it's going to be negative E prime. That's what our chance node splits on. After that, we have our decision node where we decide what to do. Then after that, the world state S materializes according to a distribution, probability distribution for S given the value plus E and plus E prime for the left branch negative E prime for the right branch, and then we have utility nodes. So a little earlier we talked about can the value of perfect information potentially be negative ever? And I said it can. We also talked about um, what happens if the action doesn't change based on the evidence you observe. We can now formalize this by looking at these two outcome trees here. So let's look at this one here at the top and this one at the bottom and think about what is different between these two scenarios. So clearly what's different is that there's this E prime chance node at the top, right? But there's another way of thinking about what is different. What if in the bottom tree here, when you take your action, which is that upward pointing triangle node, what if you are forced? Whether you're in the left branch or the right branch of the tree, you're forced to always commit to the same action. So you cannot, for example, choose leave the umbrella in one branch and take the umbrella in another branch. In both branches, you're forced to take the same action. Now it's a different scenario. What happens is effectively that you're back to the first scenario, because the outcome of the random variable that you observe, E prime, is not allowed to influence your action. And so now, under that scenario where you're forced to same, take the same action in both cases, you might as well not observe E prime because you can't condition your action on what you observe. But you can still think of that as a special case of this tree at the bottom here where you happen to be forced to take the same action in both branches left and right. Now clearly, if you're forced to take the same action in both branches left and right, the expected utility, the best you can get on expectation, is going to be worse than if you were free to choose different actions, as you might see 
the right thing to do. So what we see here is that by getting to choose different actions, you can do at least as well as somebody who is forced to always take the same action because you still have that option available, but often you'll be able to do better. Whenever, based on some outcome of the evidence, your action changes, you'll have different actions in the different branches and your expected utility will go up from what it was when you were not allowed to condition based on the evidence what your action is. And so what I just explained here is saying that the value of perfect information is always bigger than or equal to zero. Because having the option to condition your action on an outcome of a random variable gives you more options than you had before. And so worst case, sure, your actions stay the same at all times and this will actually be equal to zero, but usually this will be bigger than zero. Now keep in mind what we're looking at here is the value of perfect information of E prime given we already have E. We now understand that that's always going to be bigger than or equal to zero. Note that we didn't say that for any particular branch, let's say the right branch here, that the utility of that branch is higher than the original utility over here. Right? And in fact, for some branches, it might not be better. We're just saying that on average, over possible outcomes of your observer, observed variable, things will be better. In fact, for the weather and forecast example, one branch was worse. When the forecast is bad, on that branch, we ended up with an expected utility of 53, which was worse than the 70 over here. But in the other branch, we happen to have 95, and the way they averaged out is such that at the top here, we had, if I remember correctly, something like 78.5. And so, on average, we're doing better. But once you do observe the specific instantiation of the variable you get to observe, sometimes it will be better, sometimes it will be worse. <coughs> Any questions about this? That was our first property of value of perfect information. It's always bigger than or equal to zero. Let's look at a second property. It's not added. What this is saying is that the value of perfect information of observing EJ and EK, when we already knew E, is not equal to the value of perfect information of observing EJ when we have E, plus the value of perfect information of EK given we have E. But this what that means here is that this is not guaranteed to be true. In fact, almost never will this be true. There will be special scenarios that you can design exactly such that it will be true, but it's not a property that's guaranteed. Let's think about why this is the case. Here's an example scenario. Let's say you're trying to find out where the ghost is in this Ghostbuster grid. Your initial observations will give you a lot of information about where the ghost is. So if initially you measure, let's say, the middle square in that grid, the value of perfect information of getting to measure that middle square is quite high. But as you've measured more and more things, the value of information of then in addition getting to measure that middle, middle square will be much lower. So we see that in that Ghostbuster example, for every possible evidence variable that you might observe initially, value of perfect information is very high, but then once you've seen more things, it decreases how much value you get. That's the most typical scenario where because things are noisy, you get imperfect measurements. Initially, that imperfect measurement gives you a lot of information, but then as you go along and you've had many, many noisy measurements, you kind of narrowed it down already and an additional noisy measurement is not gonna give you much extra anymore. Not nearly as much as what you would have gotten initially. The reverse can happen too. It can be that the value, of, so what I just described is that the value of perfect information of both of those variables is less than the sum of the individual values of perfect information. How about the opposite scenario? Can we have a bigger than? When will we get something that's bigger? Let's think about this. So this would be when getting to see two variables somehow is much more valuable than getting to see each one of them individually. Here's a simple example. Let's imagine 
What you really care about is some variable z. And if you know z, you can make the right decision, you can get very high utility, but if you don't know z, you might make the wrong decision, it could be really bad. You know that z equals x, x or with y. So when z equals x, x or with y, at this point, when you find out just x, it tells you nothing about z. When you find out just y, it tells you nothing about z. And so the value of perfect information for just x, just y would be zero. But once you see both of them, you know perfectly what z is going to be, and you'd have a very high value of perfect information. So it would go here from two terms that are zero to having both of them being non-zero. All right. Here's a third property of value of perfect information. The value of perfect information of two variables given some evidence is equal to the value of perfect information of one of the variables given the evidence plus the value of perfect information of that second variable conditioned on the evidence and the first variable. And you can do this in either order. It doesn't matter whether, whether it's ej, ek, or ek, ej. The same will be true. show this, you essentially just have to work through the definition of value of perfect information, write out some long equations, and you'll see this falls out. Um, note that these equations are actually quite similar, right? It's just that the bottom set of equations is actually a correction, the correct version of the top set of equations. All right. So let's now test our intuition about value of perfect information. These are the formal properties, but let's do some examples. So first one, the soup of the day is either clam chowder or split pea, but you wouldn't order either one of them. What's the value, value of knowing which it is? Any thoughts? I'm hearing zero. Why zero? She's not gonna wear them anyway, it doesn't matter what, what the soup of the day is, it's not going to affect your decision. Um, and when things don't affect your decision, the value of perfect information is going to be zero. Okay, there are two kinds of plastic forks at a picnic. One kind is slightly sturdier. What's the value of knowing which? Well, this one depends a little bit on how you associate numbers with this, right? But let's say you're somebody who would be very unhappy if their fork breaks while they're eating and very happy if their fork stays in one piece, then the value of knowing which would be quite high. If you are eating with your hands either way, the value would be zero. You're playing the lottery. The prize will be zero or 100 if you win that lottery. You can play any number between one and 100 any integer number, inclusive one and 100, the chance of winning is 1%. What's the value of knowing the winning number ahead of time, before you pick your number? Over there. Is it 99? So, suggestion is 99. Let's see if that's what we find. So, what's the maximum expected utility when we have no information? We have a, whatever number we pick, we have a 1% chance of winning. So it would be one. Then if we do know which the winning number is going to be, we can play that number. That'd be the right action to take. Our maximum expected utility. If we do know the number, let's say N would be 100, because we can always tune our choice to whatever the winning number is. And so now we have the difference between the two, which is 100 minus one, which is 99, correct. Okay, how about imperfect information? We've always said value of perfect information so far. What if somebody gives us imperfect information? Can we compute the value of that? Well, the way we define things, there's actually no such thing as value of imperfect information. So, it's a trick question. Information 
when we look at it, always corresponds to the observation of a node in the decision network. So think back to the very first example, um, the drilling location, and where somebody might tell you where the oil is or not. If it turns out that that's a noisy way of telling you, then we wouldn't say this is a noisy observation of the oil location. We would say this is now a basinet with oil location and a noisy measurement thereof. And we would talk about the value of perfect information of this noisy measurement variable rather than value of imperfect information of the oil location. So essentially work around the idea of imperfect information by formalizing it as a new variable that's a noisy version of whatever it is measuring in a noisy way. Okay, so let's do some questions here that um, will look at value of perfect information for a decision network where we won't look at the numbers in the network but we'll tr still try to say something about the value of perfect information. So the types of things we might want to be able to say is, is it guaranteed to be zero, which means it's not worthwhile trying to get that information? Is it guaranteed to be positive? Or maybe we can say nothing about it. Um, so let's look at that. Um, we'll complicate the network a bit. It's not just oil location, but also scouting report, which is a noisy version of what the actual oil location is. And how noisy that is might depend on the quality of your scout. You could have a good scout or a bad scout. All right, what's the value of perfect information of oil location? Well, the fact that we augmented this network with these extra variables here actually doesn't change anything to the answer that we already looked at in the beginning of the lecture. Because none of these are observed. This is still the only chance node that's a parent of the utility node to compute expected utilities under certain actions. All we need is the posterior distribution of oil location given the evidence variables, which is empty. And so everything stays the same, and so it'll still be actually k over 2 in this particular case. What's the value of perfect information of knowing the scouting report? Who thinks this will be 0? Who thinks this will be positive? Okay. Um, who thinks it'll be negative? Okay, that's great. So why would it be positive? Anybody, any suggestions? You have your hand up here. Yes, with the red, blue stripes. So that's exactly right, because it gives you a little bit of information about where the oil location is. It'll inform your decision. You'll have a higher chance of drilling in the right location which will improve your expected utility. So this one was still k over 2 as before. This one is bigger than 0. How about the value of perfect information of the scout variable, whether it's a good or a bad scout? Um, who thinks it's 0? Who thinks, so we have one hand for 0. Um, who thinks it's negative? Happy nobody's answering that. Um, who thinks it's positive? A lot of people not so convinced on this one what they should do. You had your hand up for zero. Why zero? Perfect answer. So what's going on here? And this is the kind of thing we love to ask you on exams. We might actually give you numbers and you could do a very complicated calculation. You'd end up with zero. Or you could just look at the graph here and read off that the value is going to be zero. Why? We're interested in the distribution of the parents of the utility node given the evidence. That's what affects our decisions, right? Now, thin scout is de-separated from oil location, meaning that scout and oil location are independent given our current set of evidence, which is the empty evidence set. This distribution here will not be affected by the value of scout. And so the value of scout will not affect our expected utility under any of the actions we might pick. And as a consequence, the value of perfect information of scout is zero. 
All right. Um, next one. What about the value proof information of scout given scouting report? Who thinks that's zero? Who thinks that's positive? So lots of hands for positive over there. Exactly, so what's happening here is since we observed the bottom variable, as just explained, but I'll explain it through the microphone again, there is now an active triple here, and scout and oil location are now not conditionally independent anymore, and so the distribution over oil location will be affected by what you would know once you know what type of scout you have. Um, maybe sometimes the scout is malicious and tries to fool you and sometimes it's a good scout and so then you might adjust your actions based on what you observe there. Um, even though when we didn't have a scouting report it didn't matter whether our scout was malicious or good, once we have the scouting report it actually does start mattering and will affect our decisions. Then in general the observation you want to keep in mind here is that if the parents of the utility node are independent of some, of some variable z, given the current evidence, then the value of perfect information of that set of variable z, given the current evidence, will be zero because distribution over the parent variables will not change by observing the variable z and hence it won't affect your optimal decision. All right. So really what we're starting to look at here in a more general framework is called partially observable market decision processes. What is a MDP again? An MDP is a framework where we formalize a problem with having a set of states, a set of actions, a transition function, which encodes the probability of landing in a status prime given we were in state F and took action A, and then a reward function which tells us for a state action state triple what reward we're getting. In terms of expected max trees, this is what this looks like in any given state, you're trying to maximize over your actions. Then you hit a chance node, which essentially governs the dynamics. Once you were in state S, committed to action A, what's the distribution of our possible outcomes? A POMDP adds to the equation here observations. So rather than always knowing what the state is, we'll actually not know what the state is. Instead, we'll get some observations. And so what it looks like now is we actually can have a belief state, which is a distribution over what the world could be like. We'll take an action, we'll land in a new chance node here where we still have a belief state that we were in and we committed to an action. And then after we committed to that, something will happen, the world will change. We don't know how it changed because we don't get to see the state. We just know something changed. And then we get a new observation O that new observation tells us something about the world. We can then run inference to compute a new posterior distribution over possible states of the world, given all observations so far and all actions so far. And that's our new belief state, B prime. Okay? So POMDPs are effectively MDPs, but rather than having states at each point, we have belief states. A belief state, of course, is a lot more complicated than a state. A state could take on any of the values your state could be. A belief state could be any probability distribution over your states, which even if you only have two states, let's say true or false are the two possible states of your world, your belief state could take on infinitely many values, any number from zero to one. So belief states, belief state spaces tend to be very, very large. We'll look a little more at this in a few lectures, how we track a belief state. But for now, let's just tie this back into the Ghostbusters example. So, static Ghostbusters, the ghost doesn't move. We start with a belief state, a distribution over where the ghost might be. We take an action. After taking that action, which would be a sensing action, let's say, some observation will come up. There will be some coloring of that square that we measured. Based on that, we can compute a posterior of what the world is like given what we measured so far. That's our new belief state B prime. Another way to annotate this tree would be to say, rather than thinking of it as belief state to belief state to belief state, 
you can think of it as initially we have some evidence and then we have a bigger set of evidence and so forth. That will give you exactly the same tree. You can either branch on evidence you might observe or branch on what the next belief state might be. All right. So these are equivalent ways of putting this down. Now, let's see how we can solve this. We know that the belief state space is very, very large. It's infinitely large even for just an actual state space with just two possible states. So we're not going to solve this exactly. We're going to have to use approximate methods. One approximate method would be to use Q-learning with a feature-based representation. We have some features that encode your belief state. You run Q-learning. That's a reasonable way to do it. What we'll look at today is actually how to do this with Expectimax. And so what we're going to do is approximately solve this Palm DP by running Expectimax, but not running it all the way till the end of the game, but truncating our tree at some point. So what if we only consider either busting or one sensing action followed by a busting action? Remember, sensing costs us one, Busting can give us a reward of 250 if we're right, but if we're wrong, game is over and we can get no more rewards going forward. Yeah. So then we'd start with our current evidence, whatever it is. We could choose the bust action, which is a choice of many, many possible actions, really, because we can bust in any location. Each of those is a different choice of action. Each of those has a utility associated with it, depending on whether we were right or wrong. Right? Then. We can choose a sense action, which again, there are many, many sense actions. Any location we haven't measured at yet, we could decide to sense at. Then after that, we could decide to take a bust action. And so this is what our expected max tree looks like. In this case, we're solving, approximately solving, a palm DP. Now we could stop, actually, sorry, this is just encoding the sense so far. We actually want to go further than that. We also want to explicitly show the bust action, and this is the truncated Expectimax tree in which we're going to work. We could compute the optimal action in this truncated Expectimax tree, take that action, after taking that action, if it was a bust action, game will be over, we'll see what we get. If it was a sensing action, rather than executing immediately the corresponding bust action, we can replan. We build Again, a truncated expected max tree starting from our current belief that looks exactly like this. We'll start it from a different belief. Again, compute what is the best action to take, one of the busting actions or maybe one of the sensing actions. Execute that action and repeat. So let's take a look at how this plays out. So now, um, running truncated expected max, the game of Ghostbusters will be played for us. So when I click somewhere, it actually doesn't measure where I click, it just um, makes the measurement or bust, takes a busting action that it thinks achieves the highest expected value. Is it the optimal action? Not necessarily because we're having a truncated expected max tree. We didn't go all the way down, but it might be pretty good if that truncation captures a lot of what we're thinking about here. So let's take a look at what happens. So when I press the button, It'll work through that expected max tree, find for each possible action what the expected utility is, picks the best one, executes it. Try to think about what it would pick here. Like, it's gonna somehow try to figure out which sensing action, if at the next step you were to have to bust, would be the best sensing actions. So let's see what it picks. There might be some ties. Um, happen to sense over here. Maybe that's because if you happen to be lucky and you sense in a corner, you actually have a chance of hitting the ghost right on with high probability the next step, whereas if you had measured in the middle, maybe you would kind of have zero or very low chance of having a success in just one sensing action and then busting. Okay, it reruns expect the max in that truncated tree starting with this belief and it senses top left corner. Maybe the same rationale that if you only get a few measurements, the only way to have a high chance of getting high rewards is doing those measurements in locations where you can really quickly narrow things down. Um, again, it'll run expect max in that truncated tree. Now it measures over there. Um, 
give you some numbers which it's still showing me on the console here it's saying that the maximum expected utility gain from that sensing action was 17.734499778 again computing truncated expected max value it's sensed over there and this time the expected gain was 35 again see where it senses there this time the maximum expected utility gain was 80.38 and so forth so as long as that maximum expected utility gain from measuring is higher than um, one it'll measure because the cost of measuring is only one go again uh, maximum expected utility gain this time was 82 go again maximum expected utility gain was 15 likely because it's getting less informative sensing actions here because it already knows pretty well where things are go again maximum expected utility gain overall sensing actions the one it picked had an expected utility gain of 8.95 go again <coughs> Now it's, it was 8.93, go again. Um, expected utility gain was zero, or is going to be for the next one 0 0.41. So when I click now, it should decide to take the bust action because it costs one to sense. The gain of sensing is only 0 0.4. And so clicking again, indeed it chooses for hit. It hits in the right spot, wins the game, this is how this plays out. Any questions about this? If you wanted to do a more detailed computation and act more optimally, so to say, you could, you could extend this tree further than what we just saw. We already looked at a value of perfect information based agent, but it could do more accurate computation by maybe allowing for two sensing actions within its truncated expected max tree. It would look further ahead, and the further it looks ahead, of course, the better it can do, but also the larger the amount of computation necessary to explore all options. More generally, what we're doing here is solving POMDPs. That is, we're solving an MDP that's defined over belief state space rather than regular state space. Um, in general, they're actually P space hard, which is very, very hard, and you can't solve them efficiently. Um, but many real problems are POMDPs, and a lot of people will study approximate solution methods for them. It's the kind of P missing here. All right, that's it for today. Hope you have a great spring break and see you after spring break.